Well, good morning. Uh, this morning we're going to walk through the Christmas story. Um, and originally I was just going to do it the way that we have done it in the past. Um, we've done this this story on tour many times, and I thought we would just tell it the same way. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, this is this is home. This is family. So maybe then rather than just telling the story, we can also tell the story of telling the story. So stepping kind of behind the record and the music and saying, hey, what led to this? How, how did we get here? Um, what was this experience like for me? I usually leave the me aspect out of this story, um, but I thought that today it, it, might, um, it might be a good way to approach this. Because we... We hear the Christmas story and we understand it from our perspective. From the middle of our lives, what does that story look like? And that story is very separated from our lives. That for me as a kid, I saw the Christmas story as a Christmas pageant because that's what we did at my church. Every, every year we do these huge Christmas pageants and there would be all these wonderful people that had these great voices and sang these wonderful songs and they had, you know, robes and beautiful costumes. And I um, was dressed all in black um, because I was a stagehand. I, and I snuck behind everybody. I wasn't one of the star singer people. I, I was the guy moving the props um, because, you know, in one moment, Jesus is in the manger, and then the next moment, you know, he's an adult, and the manger has to go away. And you guys don't think about that, but it's very difficult. It's in a very important part of the story. The manger goes away. So I thought we would just look at that today. No. Um, the, and so that, that was my perspective of, of the Christmas story was a pageant. Um, it was something where you chose uh, three wise men. So you looked through your deacons and went, mm, who looks the wisest this year? You, you, and you. Um, and, and then, you know, you'd have one person, one guy would be Joseph. And Joseph needed to look wise and kind. And the good thing was he didn't have to say anything. So you didn't need a skilled actor. You just needed somebody that kind of looked the part and could nod along when it was his turn to nod. And so this kind of flat version, this very produced version of the Christmas story was what I grew up with. And so a few years ago, I was studying my Bible in the middle of October, and I came across the story of the wise men. I'm like, it's a little early, but that's where I am, so I'm going to go ahead and read it. And that day, what God did was to challenge me. He said, now these, these wise men did so much work to make sure they encountered Christ at Christmas. They studied, they figured out that a king, that a child was going to be born, this king would be born, and they figured out where he would be born. They took the journey to come there, and in addition to that, they were the very first Christmas shoppers. The first people to ever buy gifts at Christmas were the wise men, and they brought these expensive gifts, and they brought all their wisdom um, to encounter this child at Christmas. And that day, I just felt God saying, will you do that, or are you just going to be busy with your job, with your family, with your school, with whatever it was I was doing at the moment? Are you going to be so busy and then the morning of Christmas go, thank you, Jesus, for coming to the earth and read a little bit of Luke and move on. And I said, no, no, that's, I want to be like them. So I committed that for two months, um, all, all the way up until Christmas, I was going to study the Christmas story every day. I said, God, I'm going to do this because I want to encounter Christ at Christmas. And on about day three, I'm like, hey, God, you remember what we talked about? Um, I already, I know this story already, and it's day three, and I already know it again, because you see, when I was a kid, I had to memorize the Luke Christmas story and recite it before we opened presents, so I know the Christmas story, 
Um, I know all about the census and everything. Um, but I, I was there on day three and was kind of already like, hey, I already know this story. But I told God I would do it, so am I just for two months going to read the same thing and go, yeah, still born in a manger. You know, is that the experience I'm going to have? And I said, no, God, I, if I'm going to keep doing this, I need you to do something different. I don't know what it is, but I want you to make this special. And he did. What he did was he brought the story to life. Because I read it as a flat story, and it's not. It's real people with real lives like you and me. And we don't read it like that most of the time. We read it as these um, professional Christian actors. But that's not what it was like. This is God invading the world. And those people didn't know the end of the story like we do. Their lives were just dramatically and drastically changed in a moment. And they had to have been confused and scared, just like we are when stuff changes. Well, I don't, how am I going to deal with this? And we don't have near this level of problems. So we'll look at a few of those. One of the stories that, um, that was difficult for me was Mary. Because I, I really hadn't spent a whole lot of time with Mary. I hadn't thought about Mary a whole lot. Um, except I, I had, you know, asked her if she knew that her baby boy would one day rule the nations. I'd, I'd asked her that question a few times, but that, that was it. And, um, and so as I spent time with the story of Mary what I started realizing is how scared she must have been. A, a teenage girl saying, hey, an angel comes, you're going to bear the Messiah. And at first, that's got to be, well, it's got to be terrifying that there's an angel there. Then once you're over that, it's got to be really exciting. You just talked to an angel. Then it's got to be even more exciting. You are going to bring the work of God, the, the child of God, into the world. But I don't know about you, I have a tendency to commit in the moment and think about the, the consequences of that afterwards. Like um, when I was growing up, uh, when I was in college and I wanted to ask a girl out, I, I would just call and dial the number real fast so that she, once she answered, I couldn't get out of it. Because if I sat there and thought about it, I'd be paralyzed and it would never happen. So I had to act and think about the consequences later. Um, and, and so I, that's kind of still how I am. And I, I looked at her and wondered if in that moment she said, yes, it's going to be awesome. And then the next day started realizing what that would mean. Uh, I, have to, I have to tell my fiancé that I'm pregnant. That had to have been terrifying. I have to tell my parents. What, what does that conversation look like? Mom and dad, I'm pregnant. But it's okay because it's God's. And, yeah, see, you don't hear any of the kids laughing. That's parents, kind of that nervous, <laughs> oh, man, let's not talk about that anymore. Let's move on to Joseph. Um, but think about how she felt, not knowing how he will respond, not knowing how her parents will respond. Does she even get to have friends anymore? And so I thought about all the things that she must have been scared about, and I said, okay, well, what should I do? What I, okay, I bet she rests in the fact that God has sent her this message, and he, you know, it's wonderful. So I went back and read what the angel said, the thing that she probably went and wrote down, that she knew and realized that the angel, man, it's like six lines. It's not this huge, um, hey, everything's going to be okay. Here's how it's going to work. It's you have been chosen. You'll bear the Messiah. I'm out. <laughs> There's no reassurance in that. And I just thought, man, if that's what she has, then she has no idea how this is going to go. She knows that she's going to bear the Messiah. And that's kind of it. She doesn't know that Joseph's going to stick around. 
She doesn't know that her parents won't kick her out of the house. She doesn't know that her friends will stand by her. She doesn't know if anybody will believe her at all. And I started thinking, if those were my fears, what would my heart sound like? And I'm pretty sure it would just be fear. It would just be reciting those things all the time. I don't know how I'm going to deal with this. What's going to happen? But we actually get to see a piece of Mary's heart as she as she responds to what's going on in her life. And she doesn't respond with fear the way I would. She responds in worship. She says, I only have this little promise from God and have all these doubts and fears. But my soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices because he has saved me and he is using me as he saves the world. So the story that made me, um, that convinced me that this needed to be a record was not the story of Mary, but the story of Joseph. Because um, as, as we've said, I, I, I picture Joseph in the uh, Christmas pageant, and he doesn't ever say anything, and he just kind of nods along. And, and I just, I don't get that guy. That, that guy doesn't make any sense to me. I've never seen that guy before. That all this crazy stuff is happening, and he just kind of nods and stands behind his wife. I, I don't have any context for that guy. So I I went back and read the story again and figured out that that guy doesn't exist. That guy's not in the story. I think maybe it it was a little more um, like this, that he was a carpenter and he was engaged, and so he was building his new house. Now, in that day, they would build a home. When they, once they got engaged, they would build a home attached to their parents' house, which I'm glad we don't do that anymore. But so, so that's what his job is. And between getting engaged and getting married is he builds their home. But he's a carpenter. So he's like, hey, I'm going to crush this part. Now, being, being a husband, I don't really know a lot about, but this part's going to be really good. So she's going to be really happy for a while. And... Uh, well, you know, that's all you can guarantee. Um, and so he's working really hard, and maybe, like, he's finishing up a, a new chair to go around their new table in their new home. And suddenly there's a knock at the door. He's like, wasn't expecting anybody, but gets up and walks, opens the door, and there she is. The love of his life, his fiance is right there. He's like, hi, Mary. How's it going? Oh, no. Did I forget something? Do we have a shower? Are we supposed to be having lunch with your parents? Because, you know, guys forget stuff sometimes, and then we panic. Um, and she said, no, no, I just wanted to talk. I was like, oh, whew, great. Why don't you come in? Oh, wait, hold on. Whoosh, shuts the door. Runs around, picks everything up, you know, throws it in his room, shuts the door. Come on in. It looks like this all the time. And he brings her in and says, hey, well, I, oh, I've got, this is so awesome. I've, I just finished this new chair. It's going to be your chair at our new table in our new house. Come on, you can sit down. You can be the first person that sits in it. This is awesome. She's like, Joseph, I, but I need to tell you something. That's great. You can tell me while you're sitting in our new chair. She's like, Joseph, I'm pregnant. And he stops to think, trying to figure out a Hebrew word that rhymes with pregnant. Because she couldn't have said that, right? Because he knows their relationship, and so she can't be pregnant. But it turns out the word pregnant is kind of like the word orange. There's not really anything that rhymes with it. And soon after that, she verifies, Joseph, I'm pregnant. But it's okay. He's like, um, let's stop there. No? No, it's not, actually. Uh, this, there's, there, okay, we are engaged. I love you. 
we have not done anything that could cause you to be pregnant, but now you are. And I was not a part of that. So there's nothing that's okay. (laughs) Nothing is okay here. Go on. Joseph, I'm pregnant, but it's okay because it's God's. <laughs> you didn't even work on that. Like, you didn't even come up with a believable lie. Like, you didn't even care about me enough to try to pretend something that was believable that wouldn't you know, devastate me. Because you see, in, in the Christmas pageant, they find out that she's pregnant, and Joseph just... Mm. But that's not what happens in the Bible. You're like, Todd, I don't remember this scene from the Bible. That's true. This is what I call biblical imagination. I got the term from uh, Michael Card. And it's uh, saying, hey, God gave us imagination so we can use it when we read the Bible. Now, we shouldn't take the parts we imagined and make them equal to the parts we read. But we're trying to understand, we're trying to flesh out these words and what, what did this look like. And the words that we're fleshing out don't tell the story. What they say is in Matthew, he's very specific and says, Joseph is going to put her away quietly and divorce her. You don't divorce somebody because you think they're going to bear the Messiah, the Son of God, and bring him into the world. You divorce someone because you think they're a liar and a cheater. That's where Joseph is in that moment. And so he says, you can go now. But Joseph, no, it, it would really be best if you left. And she leaves, and he shuts the door quietly because he knows that he wants to shut it loudly. And he doesn't need to do that. And he sits down in the new chair that will never be their chair at their table in their home because there is no them anymore. All his dreams, all his hopes for what his life would be are shattered in this moment. The story of Joseph is not a cheery Christmas song. It is a man who is devastated and thinks the woman that he loves has lied to him and cheated on him. And everything that he wanted from life is gone. And I imagine he sat in that chair and cried himself to sleep. And woke up to a bright light in the room, opened his eyes to see an angel, wings and a sword, standing in his living room. Joseph. Yeah. The baby is God's. Right. Really? Really? And at that moment, can you imagine? He must be so excited. One, the Messiah is really coming, and he's coming in his day, at, in his town. All that he's heard about his whole life, the history of Israel is really finally happening. And the woman he loves didn't cheat and lie to him. This is good news. And he did still call her a liar and a cheater. Oh, this is bad. This is real bad. How do you fix that? I don't think she's just going to let it go. Forget I said it. No, I think even if she 
lets me stick around. This is going to stick around for a while. 20 years down the road, she's going to ask for a new kitchen table. And I'm going to say, we don't really have money for that right now. And she's going to go, you remember when you called me a liar and a cheater? And I'll say, okay, okay, I'll make you a new kitchen table. Now, from what I've read of the Bible, it doesn't seem like Mary was really like that. So that part probably didn't actually happen. Um, and my wife is not like that either. So I'm not pulling from personal experience and adding it into the story. Um, but can you imagine going, she had her greatest moment of need and came to me and I sent her away alone. Oh, God. I have no idea how that must have hurt him and scared him. But he agrees, says, I will marry her. I will be the husband that you want me to be for her, and I will raise this child. And I just imagine him waking up the next morning, and you know the sun's coming in through the kitchen window, and he's standing there looking out at the world that is exactly the same and is completely and totally different. And realizing that he's just agreed to be the adopted father of the Son of God. There are no James Dobson books on how to raise the Messiah. There's no one to ask for help. There's no one who really understands who he is or what's going on, except, I guess, maybe him. Can you imagine that? Now, ladies, you may not be familiar with this, but guys like to be right. So, guys, you know, just imagine if there was a kid growing up in your house that knew every single mistake you made. Every single thing you said with surety that actually was incorrect. I may not be right, but I'm always sure. That everything you said like that, he, he's like, you know, you can see him over in the corner giving you the look going, As you're teaching all your kids that the world is flat, he's like, no. Like, what? And, uh, that, that part was new. I just made that up. That's why it wasn't in the first service. Um, but, you know, I can just... God, that just blows my mind. And to think that you are going to pass down your skills, you're going to train him up. To, because in those days, a kid did what his dad did. A dad trained your child, and now you were a carpenter. He's going to be a carpenter, so you're teaching him to build things when he made the world. You're teaching him what you understand the Scriptures to be when he wrote them. <laughs> God, that must have been so hard. But he said yes. And he gave his life to it. And by the time you see Jesus as a grown man, Joseph isn't in the story anymore. He gave everything he had to raising this child and then is gone before Jesus comes and does all the miraculous things. He gave everything. So I hear that story, a guy who was heartbroken, didn't know how he would recover, a guy who didn't know how to fix the relationship that he had messed up, a guy who felt like this task was too big for him, but if God wants him to do it, he's going to give it everything he has. I looked at that and I was like, I know that guy. I know him well. And if God invaded his world, then he can invade mine as well. We're going to have the ushers come down. And if you are a guest here this morning, we're going to take up an offering. And if you're a guest, please just pass that basket right along.
But as we, as I, as I want to share with you a song about Joseph and what he gave, we're going to take an opportunity, those of us that are part of the body here, to give back ourselves, to respond like Mary did, of this is the story, and my response is to give back to you. And, uh, and so we want to give you that chance. Let's pray together. God, we love you. We love you that you wrote the Christmas story. And that you wrote it even more real than we can possibly imagine. I thank you that Mary was brave and that she looked at you. And in the midst of her doubt and fear that she saw who you were and how faithful you were. God, I thank you for Joseph. And that in the midst of his pain, he heard your truth and responded in obedience. I pray that maybe somehow this season we can do the same. May you be honored by what we give. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I told you the story for me started with um, the wise men. That it was a challenge to me. And in the midst of that challenge, I, I wrote a song about the wise men. Not really intending to share it with anybody. Definitely not to make a Christmas record. I'd only made two records so far, and you don't really get to make a Christmas record. Then you, it's, you have to wait until you're a big star, and everybody's going to buy whatever you put out. And then you can do a Christmas record that's just kind of fun because you're not really going to make any money off of it. Um, that's not like an insider secret. and uh, That's just that's the way Christmas records are. They're only on sale like three weeks a year. Um, so, you know, you're not, it's not going to sell the same as a regular record. Um, but I wrote this song and, and I played it um, for the people at, at my label. And fortunately, the head of my label who passed away this last year, John Fry, a godly man that loved the Bible and loved the Lord and heard this, this song and these ideas. And he's just like, we need to do a Christmas record. I was like, we do? I mean, I... I was starting to get these stories to come together, but I, I didn't think that would really happen. He's like, no, we need to do this. And, uh, and the first song was this wrestling match of what, what would it have been like to be the wise men? To have studied, to have traveled, to have brought these presents. So you're bringing vast amounts of wisdom and wealth and come to find a child that in his presence, all your wisdom and all your wealth is worthless. Because this child is not just a king, but is God. The word made flesh. And everything you thought you had to offer him pales in comparison to what he is offering to you. And... And this, when I was working on this record, sometimes songs came just from like a picture of what that might have looked like back then. Obviously, the Joseph, when it's for, what, what did he feel when she, when that happened? And then the song came from that moment of him kind of standing, looking out the window the next morning and going, I just agreed to be the adopted father of the Son of God. But of this, I just had this picture of the wise men coming, finding out that everything they believed was now different, and having this little hand of a baby reach out for this old man, that the hand of God was physically touching them. And it changed everything. Because he was Emmanuel. He was God with us. One of the other stories that interested me when I was approaching this record was um, the story of the, the only beings that really knew what was going on. The, the angels knew what was happening. God told them, and they knew that they had a role in it. They were going to be the ones that announced to the world that this was going on. And so I started to wonder, what would that be like for them? I don't know a lot about angels. 
never been one. Um, so I don't have any life experience to to attach to them. But I just started thinking they must have been so thrilled, so excited that this plan that God has had in place for this whole time as he, sp- he spoke in the Garden of Eden, saying that the seed of this woman will crush the head of the serpent, and the serpent will bite his heel. That as he, as he promises that, this, that, that Abraham's family will grow into a great nation, that he promises that the kingdom of David, that the family of David will forever have someone on the throne, that all these promises are coming to fruition in this moment. It's right now. And you just see them like standing on the edge of heaven looking down. They have no idea. Look at them. They're just acting like tomorrow's just a regular day. Tomorrow's Christmas. It's Christmas Eve right now. You're not doing any shopping. You're not decorating anything. There's no way you're going to be ready for this. And we get to tell them. We do. We get to tell them. Can we just go ahead and go now? No. Okay, all right. I know, I know, because it's tomorrow. How about now? No. Now? No. Still still tomorrow. Just that they must have been so thrilled of what God was doing and what they got, the good news that they got to share. The good news. The glory is all to God. And there will be peace on earth for men. It's a wonderful thing trying to tell these stories because as a musician, you usually write for yourself, trying to tell your story of how God impacted you and hoping that somebody else relates to that. Um, And as a musician, you write to express your voice. Um, But doing this record, I got to write trying to reach into the story and to find their voice, Um, to find this worshipful moment where Mary celebrates what God's doing in her life, even though to me it seems so scary. To find the voice of this carpenter, this man who builds and works with his hands all day long as he obeys God and says, I will raise this child. And to find the voice of the angels, the excitement just overflowing the edge of heaven. And gospel choir was kind of the only thing that I could find that was that exciting. Um, you've, if you've heard my music or you've just heard me talk, I'm not a very excitable person. So, uh, so it was really beautiful and fun to get to do that. It was wonderful to have Elijah with us today um, from uh, Church of Champions. We appreciate them uh, loaning him to us for the day. And so if you run across any of them, say thank you and, you know, <laughs> run over and visit their church. And, uh, and he'll, he'll lead worship for you there. Um, and... So as we kind of wrap up this morning, um, why did we do this? You know, why today? Why why do we jump in and out of these stories? For me, it's because I I want you to know that the Bible's not flat. That it didn't just happen to some other people a long time ago. That it happened to real, normal people. And the way they felt is probably the same way you would in that circumstance. So it's our story. And I wanted to tell you a little bit of my story in it. So you saw that, hey, the way that all this came together, it wasn't this magical, um, you know, super religious or super artistic thing. It was just a normal guy that God said, hey, I want you to read the Christmas story a lot. So I did. And the more I read it, God started doing things. And showing me things. It wasn't magical. It wasn't super spiritual. 
It was just time spent with God and letting him talk and listening. I'm not real great at that. And so we wanted to come and say, hey, look, God invaded the world. He changed their lives drastically. And he invaded my world and changed my life drastically. And he can and wants to do the same thing for you. Because that little baby did come and he was God in the flesh. And he did live a whole perfect life, never committing one sin. And eventually he died on a cross not for anything he had done, but for everything I had done so that my sins, my mistakes could be forgiven. He was sacrificed on that tree. He died and was buried and rose three days later and then ascended to the right hand of the Father where he spends all his Christmases now. That is the rest of the Christmas story. This is just the beginning, the opening. It continues. And it's a story for you and a story for me. I, uh, I was in a church a while back, and the, the preacher um, preached a sermon on how Christmas is about giving, not about getting. And that at this time of the year, we should tell our friends and our families that we don't want any presents this Christmas. That we're just going to bake a cake for Jesus' birthday because we shouldn't get presents on somebody else's birthday. And I, I, under, I get his heart. I understand he was saying, hey, the focus of Christmas is Christ. And that is true. But if you go back... Christmas has always been about getting. From the very first one, it was not what we did. It's what we were given, what the shepherds were given, the good news, what Mary and Joseph were given as a child. And then as the, the years went on and Peter and John were given a relationship with the Savior, and Paul was given a redemption. And Martin Luther and John Calvin and Charles Spurgeon and Steve Bradley and Joe McKinney are given an encounter with the God of the universe made flesh at Christmas. He came for all of them and for you and for me. And I can tell some of these stories and I can tell mine. I can't tell yours, but you know it well. And I can promise that whatever pain is there, that Christ plans to come into the middle of it this Christmas. Whatever doubt and fear is there, that he wants to come in the middle of it. He doesn't want you to change it. He's not expecting you to figure everything out. He's going to come into the midst of our mess this Christmas and be there with us and redeem us in the midst of it. That's the story of Christmas.